As I promised, we will continue the class in another context. So uh, what I brought here is uh, the machines and uh, the question, uh, the thing about machines. So uh, machines always amaze me, especially the fact that they change constantly in form, they evolve, uh, as you can see, and uh, actually they're getting more and more integrated and interlaced with me. So I find myself being more and more dependent on machines, and uh, I also find the machines to get some of my attributes. For example, they start thinking or sensing about the world. So uh, I end up saying, what's the thing about machine? Why are we making these machines? Now, the thing about machines is actually an episode from one of the most epic TV series, The Twilight Zone, nothing to do with the werewolves, by the way. So, uh, in this series, actually, uh, the, which was broadcasting between 1959 and 1964, 156 uh, episodes uh, in total, uh, there were many questions uh, rising on the technology of the time. And uh, the technology of the time was overwhelming, and it caused a lot of expectations, but it, al it also caused a lot of fear and reservations. So we had our fir first uh, space uh, flights, we had uh, mass communications, the uh, start of the information age, we had the uh, atomic uh, realm, and the promise, the atomium actually is a monument of that promise that atomic energy will be used for peace and for cheap energy. Uh, we also had electricity and uh, electric devices entering and pouring in our homes, changing the way we did things. It even changed the way we brushed our teeth, for example. And, of course, we had the uh, cybernetics and the beginning of uh, the robotic era and the start of globalization by the use of uh, mass transportation. So there were a lot of question marks, and when I was at your age, I was watching this series. Not, I, wasn't, I wasn't born then, but it was actually replayed again and again, rebroadcasted. I gathered all these questions and started start taking part in debates, mainly political, philosophical, ethical, uh, uh, religion debates, but I didn't find any answers. So I turned to physics, and guess what? I stayed there. So, if we're going to bring physics uh, in our uh, discussion, we have to start with the second thermodynamic law. I don't know if it's in your syllabus. I think you might not have heard of it before. But it happens to be the most important law of physics. And actually, the law that is most likely to, uh, uh, to be demolished, even if all the laws of physics are proven wrong, the second thermodynamic law will be the last to fall. And that is because this law gives us the logistics of energy conversion, the most important uh, activity of our civilization. We are an energy consuming and an energy transforming society and civilization. So mastering this law actually gave us the Industrial Revolution, which started the mechanization of our civilization. Okay, uh, you might think that this is bad, but your standard of living uh, is actually due to this uh, revolution. So if we're going to bring the second law of thermodynamics into discussion, to understand why we make machines, why are we making machines? Is it because we just can't do it? Or is it because there is some kind of drive, some kind of creative drive to make uh, machines? Why are we making them? Or there's a, a deeper necessity driven by physics. So first of all, everything starts with our demand to have specific types of energy at specific times, at specific places, and at specific quantities. And guess what? Nature does not give it to us. We cannot demand it. We have to create it. And how do we create these types of energy? If we get into a car, we need specific energy for specific time, for specific reason. And energy does not give that. So we need another type of energy, which is abundant. That means plentiful. And do we have such a type of energy? Yes, we have heat. Why? Because the gas is very cooperative as an agent. And because we have fossil fuels, plenty of them. Actually, we have the energy of our star uh, conserved inside the fossil fuels. So we have plenty of heat. And then, then we need to make the machine, because this machine will be used to do the energy conversion. So that's the end of the story. 
we can all go home. So now you know why we have machines. But unfortunately, that's not the end of the story. Because as you see, there is an imbalance here. The energy we put in the machine is more than the energy we take out of the machine. So what happens is that we have excess thermal energy. We have to get rid of. Because if we don't get rid of, of this energy, the machine will stop working. And then there is another type of uh, quantity we have to get rid of, and it's called entropy. I'm pretty sure you haven't heard about this, but we'll go to entropy in a while. You'll understand. So, if we want to have a machine to work for extended periods of time, we have to build constant flow of heat and constant flow of entropy. That is three machines for an energy conversion. And if we have a place to uh, actually get rid of entropy and heat, then we have made our first open thermodynamic system. Guess what? You are all open thermodynamic systems. Because I will explain exactly, we follow the same rules in energy conversion. So, uh, what you see here is machinery we have built for heat dissipation. These machines, and you know, you know, can you recognize this? For example, here we have the cooling tower of a nuclear factory, the cooling tower of a factory, we have the cooling tower in a locomotive, we have the air conditioning system, we have the cooling system in your computer, and all of these actually dissipate the heat of your machines so that your machines can, stop work, can, cannot, uh, can continue working. And what about you? Well, you converse energy, you transform energy, so you actually must follow the same rule, the same law, and yes, you do. You follow the same rule and you dissipate heat. You know, you dissipate heat as much as a bulb of 100 watts, 100 joules per second. That means, about, uh, that, means that today, in this school, we, had, we have emission of 300 kilowatts of energy, a useless energy, because this thermal energy cannot be used. It's just to heat the environment. So you know how, uh, how, how things will actually evolve in this uh, talk. Now let's see about entropy. Uh, have you heard about entropy before? Yes, okay, so uh, you must know the, uh, the, the other name of entropy. Entropy has two names. One is used by physicists, and the other name is, wow, information. Information is such a powerful notion that it has given the name to our era. We're in the information age. So you can understand that entropy, actually information, came off the second thermodynamic laws. So actually it's more physics than ICT. And let's explain. You have a grid here of uh, six by six um, dots, circles, and as you can see, it's highly organized. So how many bits of information do we need to describe it? How many bits? Four bits of information are enough to describe it, and we can reproduce it. So if I call someone and give him the, the information, he can actually uh, create it. So this is a high degree of order, low entropy, and low demands in information. So what about this? How many bits of information do we need here? So this is randomly distributed, and we need two pieces of information per circle. That is 72 pieces of information. Because this has a low degree of order, high entropy, high demands in information. So entropy is actually disorder. And what the second thermodynamic law tells us, that if you use energy, if you transform energy, then you have increase of disorder. And you have to get rid of the disorder, or else the disorder is so much that the machine cannot function. So let's see. This is a bedroom. If you use the bedroom, then it transforms to this. Okay, something we uh, all know. Okay, this is the result of entropy building without us tidying things up. How likely is that you can see this spontaneously? Impossible. It's impossible to see uh, entropy decrease, except if someone gets, g goes inside and actually tidies up the room. But then, the guy that tidies the room will use energy and will create more entropy than the entropy he has actually uh, put back into, uh, in, into order. Okay. So in entropy decreases, increases even if de it decreases at some time. So now you have an excuse for your untidy room. At least I have one. Okay, so there's a small detail, a very small detail here. And the detail has to do with the systems. Well, the systems actually 
evolved from low entropy to high entropy. Now, the, the zero entropy, the, the E0 level is the level of maximum entropy. If a system reaches max maximum entropy, it does no longer function. It is totally dissolved. So all the systems, there is a drive by the second thermodynamic law to go from low entropy to high entropy. And this, and this is for all the systems. Although the uh, trajectory is not the same for all systems. For example, this system here might have uh, lessened the entropy, but it still moves to this, this manner. What's the name of this trend? No one can actually uh, escape this. It has a name, and the name is aging. Yes. The more you use energy, the more you age. And guess what? I am aging, and I see myself aging, and I know that is because I use an energy, but my car is aging. Our civilization is aging, and our planet is, a is aging. So this is not something that just happens. This is something that's been driven by one of the most powerful laws of physics. So let's sum up. This is the model of a car and how it actually works. So you see, we have to dissipate heat and entropy. How is entropy dissipated in a car? First of all, it has emissions, CO2. You know, CO2 is an entropy agent. Then you have to service the car, okay? Each time you service the car, you throw away the motor oil, you throw away the, uh, the filters, and you ch change the parts that are, uh, you have to change. And this is actually taking entropy out of the car in order for the car to survive. What will happen if a car is does, doesn't go to service. Eventually, entropy will finalize and, and we get, uh, we, we will become maximum, and in the end, it will not be able to survive. And see the same model in the human being. Okay, I will tell you. Do you know how you get rid of your entropy? You have your daily waste, first of all. You exhale CO2. Do you go to the doctors? Why do you go to a doctor? What's the, what's the role of a doctor, actually? When you're ill, your entropy increases. Okay, your disorder increases. What's the doctor, what's the medical system's role? It's actually to decrease your entropy and have you viable again. And of course, you have your immune system. When you sleep, your immune system tries to actually restore you back to the, your initial condition. This is not done 100%, that's why we're aging. It takes about 85 years for a human being to reach its maximum entropy. So, if we are actually uh, dissipating heat and entropy in order to function, where does all this go? Okay, I'm pretty sure you know the answer. Here. And uh, do we have a mechanism to continue dissipating entropy and heat to the universe? The answer is no, because Earth is a closed system. So we're bound to increase the uh, thermal energy we store in, uh, in Earth and increase the entropy of Earth. And that's the aging of Earth. And uh, that's actually the big problem we're facing now. We have an aging planet, and there's no way, there's totally no way we can dissipate further. Because you dissipate your heat and entropy in your house. Your house dissipates heat and entropy to the community. The community dissipates to the country. The country dissipates to Earth, but Earth dissipates nowhere. So the troubles we're having right now is due to this fact. And we didn't notice it at the beginning, you know why? Because the, these are adding up. There's no way you can cancel what's already done. So even if you find a way to minimize, you cannot cancel entirely. So I return back to my uh, initial question, technology, because I want to give an answer of, is technology making us human to be on par with the, uh, uh, this talk here? So technology, must solve problems that are because of the aging of the planet. New problems it must be solved by technology. And uh, I still believe that technology can solve the ultimate problem. Maybe, maybe in the uh, immense uh, amount of data we have gathered since the beginning of uh, the human being, maybe a machine can find some pattern that will give us the technological insight to actually distribute our civilization to other planets. So. I finalize this talk and I say I don't know if technology makes us human, but I'm pretty sure that technology is the only way we can remain human. Okay, thank you.